1994 is a day that Cliff Domini will never forget. It was a Thursday afternoon and at Sweet Home High School, Cliff was in one of his classes when all of a sudden he bent down to pick something up and he heard this deafening sound. It was the sound of a gunshot. One of the boys in the school had come into the class and he shot another boy in the back. And that gun was literally one foot away from Cliff. Now the good news on this story is that the boy did not die, thank God. But can you imagine? Can you imagine the terror of having a gun go off so close to you? I think the only terror that would be worse is the terror of having somebody shoot at you like the people and police in Pittsburgh where that madman, that anti-Semite uh, anti went in there, that racist, and he killed all those people in that synagogue in a place of worship. Can you imagine that? In a place of worship. He murdered 11 people. He wounded six others, including four police officers. Fear and terror, those are words that make us cringe. Fear can cause us to run away, and terror can make us freeze up. And here's what I'm getting at. When you mess up, when you blow it, when everybody else is mad at you, do you fear God? When you mess up, when things aren't going right, do you kind of look at God like that man with the gun? Do you think of God like that abusive husband or abusive boyfriend? Does terror run through your veins? I guess the question I'm asking is, are you terrorized by God? Let me tell you something. If you live in fear of God for any reason, then you don't understand what fearing God is all about. And so today we're going to talk about what fearing God is and what it isn't. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, let's go ahead and please stand. And let's go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 10. And this morning we're going to look at verses 26 all the way down to verse 31. Beginning in verse 26. Everybody there? Okay. Somebody spoke for everybody. We'll have to change his name to everybody, right? Let us. <laughs> verse 26. It says, Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows so sold? For a scent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, so much of our life, so much of our relationship with you is caught up with our understanding of who you are and, and what you do and what you don't do. And, and so, Lord, there are some among us that do not understand what fear, fearing God is all about. And so, Father God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be here today. We pray that the Holy Spirit would work through this message, that the Holy Spirit would be on every person here today. To, clear, to clearly hear what you have to say, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you would speak through me. Lord, uh, an unworthy vessel, but your vessel nonetheless. So, Father God, speak to your word as well, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, when I was a teenager, I saw a movie that scared me to death. The name of that movie was The Town That Dreaded Sundown. 
The year was 1976 and I was 13 years old. That movie was a horror story about a serial killer who haunted the streets of Texarkana, Arkansas in 1946. The Phantom Killer, as he was known, targeted Lover's Lane and young couples. But you know what else he did? He targeted an adult couple in their home, shooting through the window and killing the husband. I won't tell you the rest of the story, because I want you guys to be able to sleep at night. In fact, since I watched that movie, I'll be honest, I hate horror movies. I know they're not real, but after seeing that movie, knowing it was based on, on, on real life, I don't want to watch it. That man was a monster. In fact, at the end of the movie, probably the most troubling part of the whole movie was the way it ended. <clears throat> they finally tracked him down with a stolen car, and, and they were chasing him by a railroad track, and he got on the other side of the rail track, and a train was coming, and the police weren't able to get to him. And so the Texas Ranger that was hunting him down shot underneath the train, hit him in the leg, and he disappeared in the woods to never be seen again. You know, monsters like that are what nightmares are made of. But this was no nightmare. This was real life. This man killed five people and critically injured several others. In fact, if I go into the woods today with my family, guess what? I'm usually armed. Why? Because there are still monsters living among us. Now, I have a relative who believes that his mother was a monster to him when he was a child. He talks about all these terrible things that she did to him, like burning with an iron, jerking him out of his bunk bed every night, and all kinds of horrible things he describes. And, and I have to say this, those memories are real to him. But those events never took place. The pain that he feels is real, even if those things never took place. In fact, I tried to talk to him recently to help him understand that over 30 years ago, he was hit in the head and, and uh, it changed him. It not only altered his personality, but it also caused him to start having seizures. <clears throat> and so I tried to convince him that what was probably going on was that his memories are all messed up. The reason we know this isn't true is because there's a whole lot of people that were there with him as he was growing up and those things never happened. And to me it just breaks my heart that somebody could have that kind of opinion about their mother and think that she's a monster when she didn't do anything like that to him. And the sad part about this person is that he will probably have this flawed view of his mother until the day she dies. Until the day she dies, she will always seem like a monster, even though she's not. You see, the perception of his mother was wrong. <clears throat> Some of you here this morning also have a perception problem. Not about your mother, but about your father. Not about your earthly father, but about your heavenly father. You know, some of you, you're worried about God. You're worried that God is angry at you because of your sin. You're worried that if you're just like one mistake away before God's going to give up on you. Just one mistake away before God says, that's it, I'm done. Now, the reason you feel that way, because maybe some others have done that to you. Maybe you're not welcome at family get-togethers anymore. Maybe when your old friends or your relatives they see you at the gas station or at the grocery store, <clears throat> they turn around and walk away. Or maybe they pretend that you're not even there. Maybe you're not even allowed at your parents' home anymore. But here's the key. That's people. I said, that's people. That's not God. That's people. You know, the Bible is true. And you know what God says in the Bible? You know what he says in his word? He says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Amen. And so what does never mean? It means never. It means never, ever under 
any circumstances. I mean, people will give up on you. I think when I was in ninth grade, I think my teachers must have given up on me. You say, well, Dale, how do you know that? I know that because they sent me from ninth grade to tenth grade with five F's and one D. I'm not blaming them. I'll be honest, I was a terrible student. But I wasn't stupid. In fact, in grade school, I had been an A and a B student. And later on, in college, I would once again become an A and B student. But during my teenage years, I was a mess. I think I probably could have been a poster child for birth control. <laughs> Put my picture up there and say, hey, you don't want a kid like this, do you? Kids can be trouble. It's like the story of this, um, this family who has a new baby, so the neighbor comes over and she runs into the, the new baby's older brother. She says, oh, you must be so excited to have a little brother. And he's not very encouraged. <laughs> he kind of says, yeah, mom says that we got him from heaven. So all he does is cry. No wonder God gave him away. <laughs> Kids can be problems, and sometimes, you know what? Adults can be problems, too. But here's my challenge to you this morning, and that is don't write people off. God doesn't write us off, and we should never, ever write other people off. That teenage boy who can't keep out of trouble, guess what? Someday he might be a preacher. There might be another Dale out there somewhere. That girl who's wild and crazy, you know what? She might be a lawyer tomorrow. She might be a doctor, who knows? She might even be the president of the United States someday. I'm thinking about uh, those teachers in my ninth grade. I just thought, man, if they just could have seen my future. Instead of looking at me as I was, if they just could have, for a moment, looked at what my possibilities were. When I think about that, I think about Jesus. And I think about Jesus and, and Simon Peter. When Jesus first met Simon Peter, his name was Simon. But Jesus changed his name to Peter. He gave Peter a new identity. I think Peter probably needed a new identity. Peter was a little rough around the edges. Um, in fact, at one point, after Jesus had helped him catch that big load of fish, you remember that story, they fished all night, and Jesus said, cast the nets on the other side. And the nets were just overflowing with fish. After that, he, he said to Jesus, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And so what do we know? We know that Peter was no saint. And yet the, the name that Jesus chose to give Peter is the word Petros in the Greek. You know what that means? It means rock. Later on in Philippi of Caesarea, uh, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Upon this rock, upon this Petros, I will build my church. And Peter would go on to become the leader in the church. He would go on to become a saint. He would lay down his life for the cause of Christ. See, Jesus had the ability to not see people as they were, but as they could be. And I think that's the way God looks at each and every one of us. Not as we are, but as we could be. And so let me challenge each and every one of us to do that to others. Don't look at them as they are, but think about what they could be. Amen? Now, having said that, there's still some of you here today who fear God. Now you don't really see God as a monster, <clears throat> but he might as well be. Because every time you mess up, what do you do? You run away from God as if he is a monster. See, the problem is you've got the wrong perspective of God. You've got the wrong perspective of who God is. I think maybe one of the reasons that there are so many people that have this wrong perspective of God is because of a word found in the Bible. And that word is fear. Especially when that word is connected to another word, and that other word is God. Fear God. Now that word fear in the Greek is phobeo, from which we get the word phobia. 
Now, what do you think about when you think about a phobia? I mean, that's not just a little afraid, is it? When somebody's got a phobia, they are terrified. And that, that word, fear, can be that. It can mean to fear, it can mean to be in terror of, it can mean to be frightened by it. In fact, when we think about fear in the English, that's what we usually think about. But in the Greek, there's also another meaning, which is to revere, to adore, or to have adoration for. Now, in the English, we don't have that, right? But in the Greek, that's what that word phobia can mean. And so we have to ask this question. When we fear God, are we to be in terror of God? Or are we to be in awe of God? And so how do we know the difference? How do we know the difference? Well, when I was going to school, uh, we had a biblical hermeneutics class. I, I know that's one of those words that you've probably never heard in your life and probably will never hear again in your life. But it's simply, hermeneutics is just to study the Bible. It's just a, how do you interpret the Bible? How do you understand the Bible? And I remember in that class, there was one thing that was taught to us, and I'll never forget it. And it is, context is king. In fact, the context that a word is found in is more important than knowing the Greek or the Hebrew. The Greek or the Hebrew can tell you the different meanings of the word, but it can't tell you what it means in that instant. In fact, let me try to explain it to you this way. <clears throat> Let's take the word run. You realize there are several meanings for the word run? We can use it like run a marathon. Run a race. I mean, that's like, woohoo, you're exercising. But it can also mean to run for an office. I was thinking about Amos' daughter. She ran to be a judge. And that means what? It means to compete. It doesn't mean physically running. Although, Amos' daughter, Rachel, did a lot of walking. <laughs> but it doesn't mean running. Or you can talk about running an errand. When I run an errand, I get in my car and I go places. I don't physically run somewhere. And so, when you see the word run, there are at least three different ways you can look at the meaning of it. And so, how do you understand it? You understand it by the context. If the context is a marathon, then you know it's physically running. If the context is running for a political office, then you know you're competing for that office. And so, this is the point I want to draw from that. When you hear the words, fear God, God is the context. I said, God is the context. And so when we fear God, the context tells us that it's not to be in terror of. It's not to be frightened and scared to death of. It's to be in awe of, to revere, to, to be astonished by him. Notice verse 27, or 28. It says, but do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and soul and body in hell. Now that verse, in that verse, Jesus isn't saying to be in terror of God. What Jesus is saying is, you know what, you're giving the world too much credit, and you're giving God too little. What Jesus is talking about in that verse is a comparison. So don't worry about those people, because who are they compared to God? Do not be afraid. In fact, three times in this verse, in this passage, I mean, we are told not to fear. The Bible is just full of verses telling us not to fear. Uh, and we don't have enough time to mention them all, but let me list about three different passages. In Joshua 1.9, 1, 1, God is talking to Joshua. He says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid. Do not what? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Your God will be with you wherever you go. And then in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, the angel Gabriel is talking to Mary. It says, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. Once again, do not be afraid. And then in Matthew 1.20, talking to Joseph, Gabriel, once again, he said, but after he had considered this, does anybody know what that was? That's after he found out that Mary was pregnant and he didn't want to humiliate her. He didn't want to embarrass her. And so he was going to secretly divorce her. But Gabriel says, 
But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And here's the point I want to make. Why would God tell us over and over again not to be afraid, not to live in fear, and then be the object of fear? I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. And here's the key. When you put God where he belongs, on his throne and in control, and you put your problems where they belong in prayer, you know, fear has a hard time consuming your life. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. I'd be the last person to tell you that's easy. But when you do that, when you put God where He's supposed to be, on His throne and in control, and you put your problems where they're supposed to be in prayer, you know what? Life becomes easier. When you don't do that, when you try to play God and you try to fix all of your problems and you try to fix things that only He can fix, guess what? Life gets harder. Here's another reason we don't live in fear or in terror of God. It's because of what Jesus said in John 3.17. Jesus says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And so what does that verse tell us? It tells us that God is not out to get us. He's out to save us. Yeah. It tells us that, that, that we are valuable in God's eyes. <clears throat> in fact, that kind of ties into one of what I want to talk about in verses 29 and 31 of our text. Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? Now the actual Greek word there is for an aspirin. An aspirin. And that is literally the smallest copper coin they had. I mean the smallest copper coin. And so we would say, well what's our smallest coin today? It's a penny. How much is a penny worth? You can't even buy penny candy anymore. At least when I was a kid, you could buy penny candy. <clears throat> and so it's, it's not valuable. It has no real significance. And then he goes on and he says, And yet, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. What does that mean? It means apart from him knowing about it. And even though sparrows were not valuable money-wise, even though they were not valuable as far as the people went, they were valuable to God because he noticed when each and every one of them died. And then he makes this connection. He says, but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear. Now catch this. This is the most important part. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Sparrows are valuable to God, but you are even more valuable. And don't ever forget that. If you're going through a storm, don't ever forget that, that you are valuable to God, that God hasn't deserted you. If you're going through a storm, you need to remember something I said a few weeks ago, and that is that the clouds will part. The sun will shine again. Why? Because God is on his throne, and you are always on his mind. Why? Because you are valuable. I said you are valuable. I mean, someone ought to be excited right now. Someone ought to be shouting. Talking about you being valuable, amen? amen? And every time you read a verse that you believe God is speaking to you, and it says to fear God, I want you to think about reverence. I don't want you to think about being scared. I don't want you to think about being frightened. You see, God is not a psychopath. God doesn't love us one minute and hate us the next. He's not capricious. In fact, my Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. God is consistent. You know, in 1969, John Glenn and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to ever step foot on the, on the uh, moon. In fact, when it happened, there were 500 million people watching it on television. 500 million people stood as, at awe as they watched John Glenn and Buzz Aldrin do what no other man or no other nation had done before, and that was to walk on the surface of the moon. When John Glenn said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, 
It was the greatest sci scientific triumph of that time. And yet, look how far that we have come. In fact, we're getting ready to send people to Mars. We've already sent probes and unmanned uh, vehicles out into outer space, things like uh, Pioneers 10 and 11, Voyagers 1 and 2, the Magellan spacecraft, Galileo, the <coughs> Mars lander, some of those you will remember, and so much more. In fact, I want to have a video played right now about Voyager 1 just to see you, just so you can see, I should say, what we've accomplished already. Voyager 1 strongly suggests that the probe has left the ecosystem of the Sun and entered true interstellar space. Like all stars, the Sun blows a bubble of energetic particles outward, forming in this case a roughly spherical envelope of plasma. At some point, scientists expected that the count of solar-propelled particles per time period would drop and they would see a spike in galactic plasma, indicating that the solar wind has been damped by the prevailing breeze of the stars beyond. That theoretical boundary, researchers call it the heliopause, has clearly now been crossed. In fact, the data indicate that Voyager 1, which was launched on September 5th, 1977, became humanity's first interstellar probe on or about August 25th of 2012. 36 year odyssey through the solar system across more than 11 and a quarter billion miles. On its quest, as part of NASA's grand tour, it took many measurements and close ups of the kingdoms of Jupiter and Saturn and a family portrait of the planets of which the much-celebrated pale blue dot photo is part. Sometime between 2025 and 2030, Voyager's tiny nuclear generator will no longer be able to power any of its instruments. Should it ever be found by another intelligent species, it carries a gold-plated multimedia disc. With photos of life on Earth, Spoken word greetings. Sila Mark came in. Paz y felicidad a todos. Jerry Warren, Sven Eilich, and Sanasha Planet. And a mashup of music and sounds of its home planet. But the distance between stars is great, and the probe is not headed towards any of the sun's nearest neighbors. So it's most likely that the next beings to lay eyes on Voyager will be our descendants. Those that left Earth themselves. <coughs> A truly extraterrestrial species. For Space.com, I'm Dave Bryan. that last part where they said, you know, the new extraterrestrials will be the, our ancestors, those who leave Earth and go and, and travel other places. You know, the places our children and, and grandchildren are going to see are going to be amazing. They're places that you and I can only dream about. Uh, but remember this. The reason we are going out into outer space is to understand our universe, understand our galaxy. And just our galaxy alone, it is enormous. And yet, did you ever think about this? that our galaxy is just one of billions, just one of, of billions of galaxies. In fact, what we know about our galaxy, what we know about the universe, can be compared to a drop of water compared to an entire ocean. You know, we are amazed at what we've been able to do, and we're amazed at what we continue to be able to do, but the truth is we know so little. We know so little. And here's what I'm getting at. God created the universe with all of its stars and, and all of its galaxies. You know, if we're in awe, in awe of what we've done, how much more in awe should we be of what God has done? All this stuff that, that we can't hardly understand, 
God created every last bit of it. And so the point I'm getting to here, when we talk about fearing God, it's about being in awe of God, of what He's done and what He's created. And so definitely fear God. Not in terror, not to be frightened, but be in awe. Be amazed, be reverent, and most importantly, be respectful.